Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Paul's United Church of Christ, located in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Whether you're joining us in person or online for our live stream service, we welcome you and wish you a blessed, beautiful Sunday on the Memorial Day weekend. My name is Fred Millard, and I'll be sharing a few announcements with you before we be in worship this morning. The beautiful flowers this morning have been provided, uh, the altar flowers have been provided by Gary and Cheryl G. In loving memory of Grant G. and Donald G., we also have the flowers uh, adjacent to the pulpit that are from the remembrance service yesterday for Bruce Diebold. Uh, offerings can be received in the collection plate located outside the sanctuary doors, or if you wish, you can use the QR codes in the service bulletin to make an online donation. And if you wish to mail in an offering, our mailing address can be found on the church's website at St. Paul's UCC hyphen CL.org. That's St. Paul's UCC hyphen CL.org. Uh, nursery for toddlers to three year olds is available today. Uh, our fellowship hour also resumes today in the narthex after the service. And if you are interested in volunteering to help with the fellowship time in the future, uh, please refer to the church chatter for more details. Starting on the second Sunday in June, children who come to the church service with their families will be dismissed after the children's message. So join us for Super Summer Sunday. We have lots of fun learning God's word and enjoying fun activities. Super Summer Sunday will be the second, third, and fourth Sunday throughout the summer. Teachers will be waiting in the back of the church to gather the children after the church, children's message from Kevin Cruz. A reminder today, in honor of all those who have served in the armed forces of our country, the brass will perform the armed forces salute following the doxology. If you or a family member served, you are invited to stand in recognition of that service as that, or that department's uh, music is played. This concludes the announcements for this morning. Let us begin to worship. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship today. Our first hymn is number 569 in the hymnals. It's called God of Grace and God of Glory. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing along.
Good morning to our youngest Christians. I'm Mr. Cruz, and I'm very happy to be with you here this morning. Well, we're talking today about being healthy, physically and spiritually. Our lives can be very busy, filled with so many things to do inside and outside of school. Sometimes life can be a little overwhelming. Can you think of some things that make your life very busy? How about going to school and, of course, doing homework or practicing a musical instrument or practicing on a sports team or being involved in a group that you have interest in, like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts? And of course, getting your household chores done completely and on time. Life can be very demanding and we often neglect taking care of ourselves physically and spiritually in order to meet all of those requirements and demands upon our lives. Things like not getting enough sleep or skipping lunch in order to do other activities instead. This affects our physical health in a bad way. And when we are short on time, we might say, oh, I'll talk to God later when I have more time, and then forget all about it. This affects our spiritual health in a bad way. The most important thing that we can do to be healthy and stay healthy physically and spiritually is to maintain a consistent relationship with God. The God who made the entire universe has given us our physical bodies and our spiritual souls. And he wants us to take good care of them, to keep both of them healthy. Our physical health and our spiritual health are connected to one another and they are directly related to having a strong relationship with God. When we sleep better and eat better, we interact with people better, we function better, and we connect with God better. And that makes God very happy. And I believe that when we take the time to consistently meet with God through prayer and learning about him, he makes it so that our schedules will work so that we have enough time to complete all of the things that we need and want to do. Would you bow your heads as I say a prayer? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for our bodies and our souls that you have given us. Help us to take good care of both of them so that we can connect with you and have a strong relationship with you. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. Good morning. We gather together on this Sunday before Memorial Day. There are many for whom we might pray, many concerns we might lift up. This morning, as we pray together, I'd like to lead us in prayer in consideration of our Memorial Day celebration. This is a celebration which honors persons who have died in the service to our country. We are also mindful of events this past week in Uvalde, Texas, gun violence. So we lift up and pray for all those whose lives have been transformed. And we pray for our nation and our world. We pray for peace. More specifically, I ask, will you pray for the family of Bruce Deball? Bruce passed away in May of 2020. However, we celebrated his life yesterday 
and publicly in worship, commended him to God's care. So will you remember Sharon in your prayers? Also, will you pray for the family of Bill Skaggs? Bill is a friend of mine from my high school youth group days. I learned this past week that Bill passed away at a nursing home outside of St. Louis at the age of 60. So you remember Bill's family, too. I invite you to now take time for quiet prayer. Will you pray? Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers on this beautiful spring day. Thank you for being with us in this time of worship, for hearing our music lifted in praise to you, for offering us words of hope through scripture, for gathering us together in the warmth of fellowship. We are grateful, O oh God, for songbirds, for fresh air, for blue skies and green grass, and all the gifts that make life so precious. On this Memorial Day Sunday, we remember those who gave their lives for the cause of peace. Will you make us peacemakers? We look to the future of our children and grandchildren. We ask, will you make us peacemakers? We think of our sorrowful world, our violent nation. Will you make us peacemakers? We remember that you came O oh, Jesus, in perfect love to drive away our fear, that you have given us hope and courage for the living of these days. We are grateful for our leaders, and we ask that those leaders who send young and men and women off to fight, that their judgments be sound and their motives be pure. For soldiers who have given their lives for others, we pray that their love will continue to inspire our sacrifice and one day will be fulfilled in the love of Christ. For soldiers and families who have been harmed by war, we ask, will you, through your love, make their scars less hurtful and help their lives yield to the tenderness of returning love. We pray for all those who have been left behind, that they may live on in the strength of the love that they knew. And we pray for the homeless, the orphaned, the hungry, and the innocent, all those who are hurt by war. Help us, O oh God, to pursue peace. We are grateful for all the men and women who have served our country to the fullest measure. We are grateful for the peace that we do enjoy and the freedoms that we cherish. We recognize, O oh God, that we live in a world in which people would harm one another, take advantage of one another, rule over one another, use one another, we are grateful, O oh God, that we have an example for another way of life. We are grateful that we have an example of service and sacrifice and love. Thank you, God, for all these things given to us by Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, which empowers us to live in a way that we do not think we can live. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We are grateful for the opportunity to give gifts. We remember in Matthew's gospel that we read, freely you have received, freely give. We remember the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Also, we read in Matthew's gospel, who then will, what then will anyone gain by winning the whole world and forfeiting one's life? Or what can anyone offer in exchange for one's life? So we may make an offering to God. We may give as a symbol of our lifelong commitment to God, our wholehearted promise and response to God's love. Let us give for the purpose of blessing others.
will you pray? Will you accept the gifts we offer, O God, as we go seeking peace with our brothers and sisters? In these gifts, we seek to love you with all our hearts, souls, and minds. May the peace we pursue reflect our love for neighbors as ourselves. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who allows us to present ourselves and our gifts before you. Amen. Will you be seated? A reminder, as Fred mentioned, the brass will be playing the Armed Forces Salute. If you or a family member served in a particular branch of service, as that branch's music is played, you're invited to stand. Scripture reading today is taken from Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. 
When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This morning I plan to offer a message on Sabbath keeping. However, the message I intended for this morning is deferred to next Sunday. Next Sunday I will conclude our series on Sabbath keeping and consider the connection that Kevin shared about in his message for our youngest Christians, the relationship between rest for our bodies and our relationship with God. That will be the message intended for next Sunday. Today, I will speak to the events in Uvalde, Texas this past week. Now, this is a particularly challenging message for me. It's not one that I wish to give. However, I feel compelled to apply the gospel of Jesus Christ to these events as I understand them. I also will say at the very beginning that I am being very careful about how I am going to express myself because I am aware that in person and online we have people of varying ranges of sensitivity and impressionability. And so I will not be as specific or as graphic as I could be, and perhaps I should be, but I will not be. And I'm not speaking specifically of anyone of chronological age, just a wide range of impressionability and sensitivity. As I said, I don't really want to talk about this event or the larger matters connected to it in our country today, but I feel compelled to do so. It's a terribly painful thing to dwell on. <clears throat> I've already used the word horror. That is horrifying. It is bitterly grievous, shocking, terrifying. And I don't think any of these words express the depth of our experience. If you're like me, you're already feeling overwhelmed by the troubles that we have had recently. I want to go back just two years, but of course it goes beyond that the issues and public unrest around racial division in our country seem like eons ago. But those were just a couple of years and they gave way in the evening news, of course, to the pandemic. And now war in the Ukraine, it seems more than we can bear. I would prefer not to talk about any of these things. I'd prefer just to come to church Sing, pray, see your smiling faces, enjoy your company over fellowship hour. I prefer not to talk about it. I've lately become very selective in my news intake. <clears throat> I feel I can only handle a little bit of bad news each day. And if somebody gives me some good news, I rejoice, whatever that good news is. I feel I have passed my limit some time ago. Is anyone with me on that page? Amen. But the violence in Texas, though Iru saying it is not uncommon has left me feeling compelled to speak about it. 
I am not going to give you any easy answers. And I'm not going to stand on a political soapbox and give you my political opinions, although I'm happy to do that after the message, but my role as pastor is to preach the gospel. Yes, at the time the church is supposed to be a resting station where we can go to take a Sabbath and we can bring our troubles to God or leave our troubles at home. Thank God for the church as a resting station. But it is also true that when the church does not talk about what is happening in the world, it gives the false impression that the Christian faith is irrelevant. And nothing could be farther from the truth. I think it was the famous theologian as well as the famous preacher, two very different theologies, Carl Barton and Billy Graham, both said that when the preacher steps into the pulpit, they should step in with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. I am doing so this morning. As I said, I'm not going to go into details But if you're interested and you want to go online, you can look at a website called the Gun Violence Archive. The Gun Violence Archive is a not-for-profit organization formed in 2013 to provide free online public access to accurate information. This is information that's been independently verified about gun-related violence in the U.S. Its mission is not advocacy, but documentation. The Gun Violence Archive, you can Google it. It counts what we call mass shootings. The definition is one in which four more people are shot in one place. In 2022, to this point, there have been 214 in our country. That's more than one a day. And more than 17,300 people have lost their lives due to gun violence this year alone. By this definition alone, we are deeply troubled, I think. And of course, one of these events took place this Tuesday at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Words are very difficult for me at this time. And I don't think clarity is possible for a variety of reasons. I feel deep loss and I'm thinking about the parents, grandparents, brothers, Sisters, friends of the dead who are experiencing loss that will last the remainder of their lives. I reached out to my friend and fellow pastor, really childhood friend, known him since I was 12, Jerry McCaskey, and part of his response to me included this portion from the book, Autobiography of God. We listened to a rabbi speaking at the funeral of a young woman who was murdered. Quote, we are here this morning not only to grieve a life we hardly knew, we are here to grieve the life that will never be. In my religion, there is a compendium of religious discourse called the Talmud, and it says that he who kills another destroys a world. And so we come here today to grieve not only the life this young woman was deprived of but to mourn the souls that would have been her children and grandchildren and their children down through the generations to the end of time. A universe of possibilities died when she was murdered." Unquote. Whatever your theology about heaven, 
and about where victims currently live in God's loving care. I think you grasp something of the depth of grief and loss that has resulted from this senseless violence. Well, what can we say about the gospel of Jesus Christ in relationship to this tragedy? We suffer with, we hurt with, we mourn with all who are involved. The gospel of Jesus Christ, as I understand it, is acquainted with, knows intimately grief and mourning. Indeed, it was born into suffering and death. We understand that this is tragic and we feel morally outraged because we love God and we serve a moral God. And in a strange way, whenever we say this is wrong and evil and bad, we are really affirming our belief in God because things can only be wrong and evil and bad in relationship to an ultimate good and right and perfect, a morally right God. This is the God we believe in. So we actually do experience God in our moral outrage against these events. And I would say to you this morning, it is very important that we pay attention to, in spite of our desire to flee from the weary burdens of these past two years, it is very important that we pay attention to what we think and how we feel about these events. It is important because our thoughts and our feelings will shape our future, will determine our next steps, our responses, our actions, your actions, my actions, and the actions of all the other average people in our country. They are going to determine where we go from here. We are not helpless. And those who profit off of violence are not more powerful than us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is clear that the highest way of life, the way that we are called to, is a life of peace. It is loving service to others. It is life, not death. It's easy enough to say if all of us just followed in Jesus' footsteps, we would be a very different people. It is easy enough to say that, and it is true. It really is, I think, the truth. I believe it with all my heart. Jesus Christ is our way, our truth, our life. But we as individuals, myself included, and we as a nation have a very hard time following him. What would it mean for us, you and I, to spend and vote and recreate and work and volunteer for peace? What would that really mean in our lives? We live in a culture that, I think, personal opinion, glorifies, loves violence. We consume it daily. We revel in it. We enjoy it. We pay big money to watch it. What does that say about us? I don't think the answer is easy. And I don't think it's readily apparent. The answer involves complicated situations and circumstances. Do we need more legislation or more restricted legislation? Or do we need to enforce the laws that we have? Do we need more mental health professionals or sociologists or legal experts? Do we need more political advice? 
Is it sin? Is it sickness? What is it? What is the root of the problem? Well, I think there are many things that are symptoms of deeper things. The symptoms themselves have negative effects. But the, frankly, I find it to be very confusing. I hear Christian people say, we need more legislation, stricter gun laws against certain kinds of guns. I, see, I hear Christians say, no, we don't need that. It's not guns that kill people, it's people that kill people. I hear Christians say all kinds of things. I do believe that Christian people can make a difference. I do believe that Christian people can prayerfully, seriously apply their faith and discipleship to this matter with the intent of faithfully serving the Lord, the Prince of Peace. I believe we must do this if we hope for any changes in our country. Our country is deeply wounded. Our country is ill. That illness is compounded by our violence. And our violence is a symptom I think, of something far deeper. We are broken in our connections to God, to ourselves, and to one another. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that when Jesus was born, there was a King Herod who took the lives of young children in order to stop it. Thankfully, that is part of the Christmas story that we avoid at Christmas time. But this story shows us, it reminds us that Jesus' birth was accompanied by just such a senseless horror, not unlike the events in Texas this past week. Jesus' earthly ministry ended with him as a victim of senseless violence. I know we say, and the Bible says it was God's will, but if you read it carefully, my take is it was God's will that Jesus' death demonstrate the heart of sacrificial love beating in God's chest. And it was a means to defeat death, but the manner of his death, that senseless violence of his death, that was done by evil men. God used the cross, but God did not stipulate the cross. The New Testament tells us it is because of the events like this event in Texas that Jesus came to us and still desires to come to us. I don't believe God raising Jesus from the dead was meant primarily for us to ameliorate our grief. It does shape our grief, even though we still need to grieve. And I would not run to any of the parents or family members who have lost a loved one in this tragedy and say, oh, but your child is with God as a means of talking them out of their grief. We need to honor their grief. We need to feel our own grief because grief deferred just makes us sicker. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is meant to identify Jesus' life, his life of peace and sacrifice, his life of teaching, do not resist evil, as the way to life as the way to truth, as the way. His resurrection is meant to empower us, people of faith, 
with God's spirit so that we might follow him in the path of peace. So really, the questions are, what does following really look like for my life? How do I consume violence or how do I perpetuate violence? How do I vote? These things are questions of faith. What does following him look like for me today? Do I truly want to live in peace? Remember as a child, when there was a fight on the playground, I don't know if there are fights on playgrounds anymore, maybe they break them up, but when I was a kid, occasionally there would be fights on the playground and everybody would rush to watch. Do we really want to live in peace? That's the question. Do we really want to? And if we do, what are we willing, willing to give up? What are we willing to change? What are we willing to do? Do we really want to be peacemakers? That's a hard question. Can we give an honest answer? Some people just love to fight. They do. There's people who just love to fight. But Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I have seen the glory. Please rise in body or in spirit and let's sing, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
Blessed be you, O Lord, God of the humble and help of the oppressed. Blessed be you, Lord, support of the weak and refuge of the forsaken. Blessed be you, Lord, God of tenderness and compassion. You are rich in kindness and faithfulness. You keep us in your love forever. Amen. Thank you.